to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Today is March 27, 2018, and you're listening to our first Human Factors Cast Healthcare Symposium bonus episode. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours from Boston, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What's going on, Nick? It's been an awesome day here in Boston so far. A little cold, but a lot of Human Factors in healthcare. Good, good. Well, I'm glad to hear it. I'm excited to see what kind of interesting things you have going on over there. So let's break it down. We talked briefly at the end of last night's episode about some of the stuff you saw, but we had to cut it short because of time. Now, I want you to go over the remaining things. I know you said you only had a couple more things, but what what happened yesterday? So yesterday, the biggest thing I did was go to the poster session last night because it seemed like from the actual program that there was a lot of people that were focusing in their research efforts from different universities and companies on mobile apps that were going to be used just inside of the healthcare setting, whether that was something as simple as tracking having like monitors for patients through a cell phone for nurses and doctors or something as complex as, you know, integrating different different apps to robotic systems but funny enough that's really not what i saw a whole lot of because most of the most of the people i went to go see last night were actually not there either their poster didn't show up or something something weird didn't happen but what i ran into was a lot and i talked a little bit about this last night was a lot of applications of both ar and vr inside of hospitals and specifically um, ors as well as for patients just navigating a hospital so it's really interesting to see how much tech is being put into these complex ecosystems yeah that does sounds uh super interesting i'm curious as to what the ar application i know we talked last night about the vr applications what kind of ar applications are you seeing in healthcare so this was a really cool instance where somebody got to basically do like a full breakdown of a system that's in hospitals that I've actually never seen before in any of the hospitals in California or in places I've lived before. And Nick, maybe you've seen these, but apparently there are some machines that you can walk up to in a hospital and you can basically tap on it and say, hey, I need to go see this doctor. And what it'll do is it'll give you a readout of where, what the directions you need to get to that doctor's office. Um, now, oh, that's neat. As, yeah, it sounds awesome in concept, and it is a great idea, but there was a myriad of problems that came with the designs of these systems. Because they were mass-produced, they were often just reading blueprints of, of any hospital that it was put in. So the orientation of the machine was not always initially correct. You also had problems with some of the search features where it wouldn't be able to find doctors or nurses, depending on how you searched within the system. There was just a lot of existing problems with the biggest one being, of course, that you know that that typical old adage we have in in psychology that your your working memory really can't hold anything more than seven plus or minus two items on average, right? Well, imagine having to memorize at least seven steps of how to get to somewhere in a hospital that maybe you haven't really been to before or are using le- using language that you're not really familiar with, with like specific wings of the hospital and things like that. So what they came up with was one that they needed to redesign from the ground up how to implement these kinds of systems. And one idea that they're pitching is, an, is a companion app that actually presents kind of an AR experience. So what this would be like was would be like almost just following a little green line or map to where you need to go. Instead of having to worry about finding a machine, you could just enter the hospital, download the app that you need, and then it give you a little, you know, path on how to get to your doctor's office or something similar to that. Oh. I love that idea. That is pretty awesome, especially when you consider the fact that, like you said, there these machines necessarily aren't available, right? You have <clears throat> you everyone has this presumably everyone everyone in developed countries at least have these devices in their pockets that they can download an app to, and the accessibility just becomes that much better. So that's that's really exciting and really promising. Yeah, it was, that was probably one of my favorite talks. I, I sat there and just couldn't believe that we're seeing, again, AR, something that's typically I've seen a lot in games or a lot in, like, you know, real world experiences like Pokemon. Um, but now this is this is kind of getting to the point where you can apply it in just an everyday context. It would be helpful for anybody from me to uh, a younger like a younger child or even somebody that's elderly and never been to the hospital before. So it just has so much utility uh, and in a new evolving technology. So fun stuff. 
That's exciting. Now I see machine learning here and AI. What's what's oh, that my about? Yeah. So this this kind of stuff was really blowing me away, and this had to do actually much more with some of the. AR or the VR concepts that I talked about last night because um, I got into a conversation. I'll recap real quick for anybody that might have missed the tail end of the episode. But what you what I talked to or who I talked to was a couple of guys that are trying to do some in, the, in a military context, but also in a commercial context. It's basically putting on a VR headset and a couple of accelerometers on the body to really assess after a concussion if somebody is in the different um zones or thresholds to be able to either like go back into play or go back into combat or if they need to like go to the hospital immediately trying to figure that kind of stuff out so when i talk to the actual data scientist that's working on this project that's really where they want to go they they don't because i mentioned this a little bit last night that they that i talked about that some really it's not a it's not really uh it's not really the case that do you have a traumatic brain injury or a TBI or not? It's much more looking at this graded threshold. And by collecting data from more people that use this in different contexts, they're hoping that they can not only help quicker or have like quicker diagnostic measures with in place as like time goes on and they collect more data from uh, different representative samples, but they also want to help kind of implement this in hospitals so that they could potentially use this as a very quick and dirty measure for if somebody comes in comes in fast and you really know where they at where they're at in terms of their the severity of the TBI immediately once entering in the hospital. So that's really more the application of machine learning and AI in that context. Well, that's pretty cool, man. I I am so excited to hear though. So was that everything from yesterday? Because I want to make sure we cover everything from yesterday before we move on to the stuff today, because I'm looking through the stuff. And I'm like, wow, I want to know about that. Yeah, so that's as much as I did yesterday. I spent a lot of time just kind of perusing posters. And this is the most that I can remember and talk about in a intelligible form. Um, that's actually, okay, Blake. We're... <laughs> yeah. So that's all I can really, that's all I really got for the poster session for yesterday. Um, but I did see a fair few panels today. Well, excellent. Well, let's get into it. Cause there's, there's a lot of good stuff here. We have our show notes, uh, which you can access if you're a Patreon subscriber on our Slack channel. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff here, man. Why don't we break it down? All right, let's go. So the first panel was called the Dirty Human Factors of Reprocessing. So best practices in design, IFU. So that's, I think that's uh, something to do with like information user interfaces and then testing and procedures. So uh, Nick, just to clarify for everybody, a lot of this, and I feel like I need to say this just because of some of the talks that I was in, uh, All the, a lot of this that I'm going to relay is definitely opinions of people and it's not necessarily representative of people like the FDA or anything like that. And also, I'm quite new to all of this terminology that I'm going to be giving you. So I'm going to try and make sure that I break down some of the definitions that I heard to really make a little bit more sense about the things that I saw today. Um, So what is reprocessing? So reprocessing is basically just cleaning of a medical device once it's been used in the OR, which I don't I don't know about you, Nick, but I didn't even think about the idea that, oh, devices are often used more than once outside of an operating room and they have there's got to be some kind of process for cleaning and making sure that they work right did would you ever yeah. thought of that i mean that makes sense but it's not something that is like in my you know conscious when i think about hospitals that's not something that i think about yeah okay so at least i'm not alone there but what what they were talking about is about late in the early 2000s, the VA or Veterans Hospital really experienced a major problem with spreading diseases related to reprocessing procedures. So again, there's there's procedures in place for cleaning medical devices so they can be used over and over. But if based on, and a lot of this talk will focus on where the problems are, but if things are not done correctly or you don't follow the exact instructions or if the device is designed a specific way, you just introduce a lot more um, in possible infections into the population. So to, to give you kind of a little big bit of some numbers around this that were pretty shocking to me. So about over 600,000 people that are enter in the hospital can gain infections of some kind and around 75,000 people die in hospitals to those kind of reprocessing related infections every year. So it's a pretty widespread problem. Um, and so these kind of, and uh, to again, give you another insight into how bad this is in uh, the per- in particular to the U.S., like a lot of the people that actually have to get specific types of surgeries will leave the country because they 
they understand that okay this is this is typically a problem here in the united states the reprocessing process or recleaning of medical devices so they will leave the country to actually get these types of things done uh so that's that's just kind of setting up the problem uh and then, so this was all the things that I saw today were panels. So it's it's kind of really breaking down, kind of where can we improve this reprocessing process? Where where is this breaking down and all that kind of good stuff? Um, so it really starts, and this is what I found most interesting about this entire set of talks, is that the only real guidance that's provided is definitely good guidance provided by the FDA. But where this is breaking down is actually the instructions that medical device companies provide, because again, you can only provide so much information that people will actually consume because somebody made a great point and I'm, I'm sure I have it written down somewhere in here, but it was basically that a tech's job is not to read. It's to do their job and clean the instrument as efficiently as possible to get through the entire day shift of surgeries that have to go, go through. Um, but kind of pulling on that a little bit more, medical devices themselves are not really in, when we talk about like product life cycle, you think of just using the device. Well, part of use in this case that most manufacturers do not account for is reprocessor, reprocessing or cleaning the actual device so that it can be reused. So that was a big point of contention throughout most of the talks, including people from the FDA that were talking on the specific subject was that it's it's not so much bad procedures or bad instructions it's just a lack of you know to the left thinking as sometimes we call it in human factors of making sure that the, the device meets every like aspect of the design or the product life cycle uh, so that it's actually designed in a way that's you know helpful for people to do this and quickly and efficient and those kind of things yeah i mean this this all sounds like uh a whole new domain that I am completely unfamiliar with, but I mean, it's, it's definitely a problem in that space, right? It's, it's important that they're talking about it. And it's really great that we're getting sort of this, these panels that kind of, uh, that focus in on these ideas. Um, and, uh, so, so let's see here. We're, we're on Anthony Andre. Is that where we're at right now? Or are we, Sorry, hey Blake, did I lose you? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, cool. Sorry, my headphones are kind of going in and out. My bad. Um, Th that's yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so that that was kind of the the starting talk from Hildebrand, right? It was much more about okay, so it's it's not just people in the process. It's also you know how manufacturing manufacturing companies are creating their instructions, but also how they're defining they're designing the actual device itself, um, and this was this was kind of a great set of talks and you kind of you see this theme throughout all the panels that i've been to is they bring diverse perspectives and somebody uh i can't remember anthony andre's actual company uh, but he brought up the questions about whether you need reprocessing for, for your device in your company and there's a he says a series of questions about what you should do or what you should be thinking about if you need to reprocess your device designing that process but the real takeaway was is by asking these questions, really the company's answers are typically the barriers that you'll see in companies are that this is going to cost twice as much. You're, you're running into the problem of not passing FDA like minimum requirements because you're trying to go over and above by creating new training materials, new evaluation methods, new processes in general. And it just ultimately leads to problems down the road. So that's I, that his talk really summed up the fact that it's not so much about um, whether companies want to do it or not. It's much more about from a business aspect and that they have for so long been only meeting specific requirements minimal for the FDA compliance that you're really, it's really going to be hard to push the threshold anymore without some, some better evidence that this is super problematic in devices. Um, hey Blake, so let me ask we, a quick question. Let me yeah. ask a quick question about these panels. So are they giving a presentation and then kind of discussing it or are they all just kind of giving their two cents and then um, the next person talks or, or, or how are these panels structured just so our yeah, listeners so kind of get. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Nick. So what they, what they actually do is it's a 45 minute session with about four panelists, four or five One of them gives a 10 minute talk on what they're kind of there to present. And then at the very end, there's there's some sort of moderator that starts off with a with a question, or in some of the panels, they actually just open it up for a Q and A at the very end. So it was about like 15 minutes of that. 
Okay. All right. So that, that helps paint the picture a little bit better. So those questions that Anthony is asking the company, um, the, those are really important, right? I mean, these, these all make super, super sense to me. Uh, I know that's, that's a word, that's a word, super sense, but I, I mean, these are all fairly obvious. And in hindsight, it makes you wonder why this hasn't been done. And in fact, this kind of links into the stuff that we were talking about last night. I think you actually make a point a little bit further down in our show notes about that. Um, the good science, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that does really tie in. So like one of the questions that he does ask is about reprocessing or, changing the process of how you des- develop and design your product to meet these end goals is how are you actually going to study it? Right. And this, this was something that I, that just rung true with me last night because I was still on the mindset of that bad science and psychology. And something you talked about was part of the problem is it's, it's almost impossible to replicate a setting or an environment in a hospital in a lab place. Uh, they, they gave a great example of they were really excited in, the, in their lab that they had created a sink with running water. Well, once they, once they had actually created a sink with running water, what they discovered was none of the actual materials could fit under the sink where they were in a, in a traditional hospital. So their testing environment was kind of null and void, even though they put all this work in. So it's just it illustrates that these kinds of companies are really thinking so forward that they're trying to design actual hospital environments within their own laboratories that meet standards so that they actually can try and replicate the setting as close as possible because it, it's a it's an interesting problem right i mean you're you're in such a complex environment uh, that you can't you can't stop it and run real tests in real time in it. So you have to try your best to create simulations that model it the best it, best that you can. Uh, and it's got to be some of the most intense simulation work that I've ever like heard of or seen work from. Sure, and I I think even in that that uh, fixing the broken psychology, I think they even say you know they leverage this from. <laughs> Um, they, they leverage this uh, pre-registration idea from um, uh, from from the medical field itself. I mean, like it's it's interesting to see. Uh, I mean, this is medical human factors, but it's more it's it's more healthcare, and uh, it, it's definitely interesting to see that that difference in sort of how research is treated and the fact that. Um, you know, they're already implementing these pre-registration things that we talked about on last night's show. Man, this is all really great. Uh, you want to jump into the next person? I'm just trying to move us along for time, but yeah. I, I know I I know I've been in your shoes. I know how how much like it's just there's so much stuff you want to talk about, and uh, I encourage anyone who is really interested in this stuff reach out to Blake or uh, like I said, <clears throat> we do post our show notes in the Patreon uh, channel. So. Um, you know, you can, you can follow along there and there's, there's plenty of good resources for you. So, uh, Blake, why don't we jump into the next? Yes. Yeah, so the next one was really, it was, I don't know. It was very eye opening for me. And this is from Steph Serafina. If I mess up her name, I truly apologize. Uh, but she actually works for intuitive. So this is a company that it, if anybody's familiar with robotic surgery, I know we talked about it on the show, but they make one of the biggest commercial products for robotic surgery called Da Vinci. Um, and she was the one that brought up a lot of this. There's there's so many infections in hospitals and X amount of people actually pass away due to them every year. Um, and an example that she gave that's, that was truly heartbreaking is it actually happened to her own mother um, actually getting MRSA from preventative antibiotics. They ended up causing another infection. And oh, no. that in that led to loss of life. But because of that, she really got involved in this and has since moved through into its intuitive's ranks to really take control of some of this reprocessing and trying to get it much more standardized. Um, and what's really interesting here that I just, I wouldn't have thought about had I, had I not been here with Elise and meeting some of the people that she knows that have worked in robotic surgery, um, that, that there's such a massive over I'm trying to think of their way to describe it, but there's a massive impact of course of humans having a hard time, you know, following the correct guidance or dealing with, you know, medical devices that are hard to clean or hard to make right. Uh, but think about how it's going to translate when we have robotics in a much, you know, larger form in the hospital room. Now it's a much more complicated piece of soft piece of uh, mechanical machinery that has to be cleaned and prepped and ready for the next surgery. So really bringing this paradigm shift in into thinking much more about 
how this has got to how a product's got to exist without the entire throughout its entire life cycle is so important because it's going to affect how ro- how efficient and effective robots can be in the operating room and how much they can re- they can potentially reduce you know different surgery incidences or er- use errors or any of that kind of you know human error related problems that we see in ORs um, but it's all going to be kind of moot if we still have to deal with you know we can't we we have like a a higher proliferation of disease due to not being able to clean these more complex machines, if that makes sense. Yeah, it seems like not only is the common thread on this, you know, cleaning and reuse of these medical devices, but also the getting to the left of these processes that are already in place. I mean, it feels like that is a really big focus of a lot of these presentations, uh, especially because getting to the left means that you can better prepare for these types of things in the future, and especially forward thinking to things like robotics and robotic surgery. I I feel, would that be an accurate statement, Blake, do you think? Yeah, and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump down to the last speaker uh, because he was from the FDA. His name was, his name's Lieutenant, I'm going to butcher this, and I do apologize. It's Lieutenant Hanbei Wyor. Um, he works for the FDA, um, and this was a really interesting piece of the talk because now we're we're listening to companies and people that are active in the community of healthcare and human factors talking about this problem. And then at the very end, we have somebody from the FDA bringing up and really echoing the same uh, the same kind of points that they were that it really comes down to device design and better instruction. Um, but the, the interesting thing that he brings up is that with FDA guidance, like it's, it's, it's just that, it is guidance. It's supposed to set the bar vague enough and minimal enough so that people can pass. But really what the FDA is looking for is when these devices or these procedures come to them, they want the, the company to have het, set higher standards so that they – to show that they've really thought about it, they've tested it in, in, you know, correct use case environments, stuff like that, because that it's really companies that have the most control over how well the stuff is tested, how well it's developed. Um, and an interesting problem that I hadn't really thought of before is, that he mentions is a big problem is, is that a lot of companies that are building these devices or engineering them are often using human factors consulting to come in and do the testing. And there's nothing wrong with human factors consultant firms. There's so many of them and they all do great work. The problem comes in when the companies are basically just handing off to the human factors consultant like hey go do this validation testing we've written the guidelines we've written how this product's going to be designed we just need you to actually carry out the test to the t of what we've already written so that's i think the big source of not being far enough to the left or not being far enough ahead of development of procedures or designs or doing anything with users that kind of stuff so that was a really important point to hear especially when it's coming from the fca is that that can be problematic and i think I would hope that a lot of companies hear that, but I, it's, it's again, kind of our job as human factors practitioners in any field, but especially in healthcare, it seems to go back to the companies that we're either working with or that we work within and really evangelize the, the process that we are trying to use and what the importance of it is and how it's going to overall have a better impact. So what were some of the – so you mentioned that they, they all kind of give their talk and then they have a panel at the very end. Was this one of the ones where they discussed this issue at the very end or was this one that they opened up to questions? This is one they just opened up to questions at the end. Uh, I was running a little bit behind, so there wasn't too much discussion among peers about what they thought. Uh, that's unfortunate. I'd be curious to see what they had to say uh, listening to not only their uh, their peers – presentations but in the context of their own um okay well why don't we get into the second presentation that you went to today yes oh uh, this this was something i had never heard of now that's not really a surprise since i hadn't heard of reprocessing but this is a type of engineering that i i, I remember seeing it written down in a systems engineering textbook for a class i took in grad school uh, but it was all about resilience engineering. And so it's there's evidence and what evidence there is for using it in healthcare or that it exists in healthcare. Um, so the best way that I can really describe this is, and it, this, this comes from the first panelist who's a, a university professor and I think it's University of Florida in Jacksonville, uh, Dr. Shauna Perry. And she gave like a really bunch of great analogies about how this really works. But oftentimes when, we're thinking about how to overcome a problem. We're, lo- we're, we're looking at past failures. So if you, 
I don't know. It, the best way I can really describe this is they're trying to turn that on its head. So really thinking about like how has humanity survived so long? Well, not looking at the without looking at the failures, looking at what you actually have done right. Um, and so the, and the fact that this kind of exists in some bio, biology aspects, too. So the, uh, the example they gave that I've heard before, but not applied to this context is sickle cell anemia. So technically, sickle cell anemia arises from Africa as an adaption to malaria because it allows you to, you know, live your life outside of even if you become infected with malaria. But once taken outside of that specific context, so let's say removed from Africa and somebody moves to the U.S., has children, passes on sickle cell anemia, they're not they don't have that robust immune system or the need to fight off malaria. So it creates a disease that ultimately in ultimately shortens people's lives because it's now outside of the context that it was born in. Mm. So that's, that's, that's a little bit of what they were really getting at was trying to see what mechanisms there are or exist in the environment that allow you to survive as long as we have in a positive light, or at least that was my best interpretation of it. Okay. I, yeah. So just to recap really quick, resilience engineering is basically kind of engineering to make sure uh, that thing can take a beating um, and still survive. Uh, and what it sounds like, I, I'm just trying to picture how resilience engineering plays into this sickle cell anemia. Are, are they building it into, um, are they just kind of talking about the context through which sickle cell anemia came, you know, to the U S or are they talking about how we need to create, uh, applications or, um, products that are going to be resilient to, these types of um, diseases that that can potentially adapt to these things. So really, it's a combination of both, and I know that's a bad answer. It depends, truth, because this is yeah, it does because this is a very much emerging field, and that's the f- that's the field that I got because half of the panel you kind of had on one side of the room, and then the other half was on a totally different end of the spectrum. So very much academic versus the engineering part of it. Um, But the basic idea here is, especially in healthcare, is that we have a, like healthcare is just a giant dynamic system. So there's a lot of moving parts from your patient to nurses, to patient family, to actual techs, to physicians. There's so many moving pieces that it's almost insane how many people are living through the experience of having to be in the hospital and surviving and getting out of it. And of course that's going to be a positive or it's going to be a much more positive view now because we have a lot of advances in modern medicine, but with all of these moving parts, it, their, their main point was that we should be seeing a lot more people dying in hospitals, but we're not. Something is being, something is very successful here and we need to really pull out what that is and kind of, Pull, keep pulling that thread so we can get past anything that is causing any kind of mortality rate within hospitals. Um, and an, kind of another another point of view was from a mechanical engineer um, named Dr. Lay, and she has a firm in Texas that really focuses in on resilience engineering, uh, thinking about it from a very much um, hard engineering perspective, right? So th- there. I'll try and illustrate it with another example that they gave. Um, so a couple of years ago, I cannot remember the specific years ago that this happened, an astronaut almost drowned in space during a spacewalk. Whoa. Uh, and it was something that, yeah, it was. And when I thought about it, I was like, I don't even understand what you're talking about. And then they described it. And it was literally them on a spacewalk trying their hardest to get back to the spacecraft bay before their helmet filled up with water in, zero, in a zero-G environment. That's kind so, of sickening to me that that could happen. Yeah, well, let's let's take that a little further. Have you did you ever hear about that? I, I feel like maybe I have in passing, but it's still just as shocking when I hear it again. Yeah, so that was that was a big thing in the entire room. Like none of us had even heard that that had happened, and that was kind of part of some of the contingency mes- measures that NASA had built into their process to try and keep things as closed in as possible when these predicted um, accidents or events would occur. Um, so what the what these resilience engineers were brought in to do were really focus in on 
Like, how do we stop these things from ever happening again? And so this is where you see a difference in thinking style from trying to be very predictive, like the, like NASA's contingency plans for when things go wrong versus being very proactive to what happens when a bad event arises. So think of it as, as if NASA would like to, NASA definitely asked after this event, when they hired this particular firm, like, Hey, how can we prevent this from happening, happening again? And the, the way the resilience engineering teams kind of look at the problem is not how you can avoid a problem. It's more so can you put enough of the correct measures in to when something bad or reverse happens or surprise occurs that you can quickly respond to it in the in ways that are not maladaptive. We're going to end up with loss of life or right. something like that. Yeah, that's such an interesting design approach. And and like you said, I mean, that's something that you saw in a textbook before, but it, it seems to be really gaining, gaining a lot of traction and something that a lot of researchers and engineers are using in their design. And it's it's hopefully going to prove to be something that's that's uh, efficient and that can, um, you know, stand on its own. Yeah, and I, I, I think that, I think that it will be, but th- there was a very much, very much a dichotomy between the two of the, from the engineering side and the academic side of what it meant to be a resilience engineer or what, how you were tackling problems or what it actually meant. Um, but it, to me, they were both getting at the same fundamental principles and it was being prepared for the uncertainty of a situation and how you can build in through training or through screening of personnel getting people into the roles that are going to be able to proactively act under very intense pressure situations. And one, one point that came from both the talks that I kind of distilled into one was that this, the biggest fundamental I heard in the talk was that you really have to have a diverse team for diverse p- points of view and perspectives for looking at the same problem. Um, and I'm seeing this a lot across a lot of different articles or through social media from design and development of big tech companies as well. That there's this there's this real big need to when we're hiring people for teams to make sure that they're they're not just like us, right? That they're bringing in something fresh to the door that we ha- or can think about problems in a way that you wouldn't or I wouldn't, uh, just so they so they can actually have a chance at tackling these really tough problems in a proactive way. Right. And, and it provides the opportunity to grow and not only, yeah. you know, as a team, but, but your own knowledge as well, because then you can bring that forward into, into other designs and, and engineering solutions. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, I don't know. I like the, the idea of some of the collaborative space that a lot of these guys are trying to get at. And I think that that's really the key to any of these problems we see is much more collaboration, especially in healthcare, because there's a, there's a well-known and even documented kind of um, in very tense culture between different uh, use, user groups from patient to physician to nurse. So that's more, you know, more fundamental understanding of each other, the better we can interact and produce a better system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but I'm going to kind of scoot down in the notes to Dr. Blocker, uh, and he talked to, he actually was doing research related to developing tools to help us assess resistance called the e-governance tool. Uh, and so this was, this was a totally, again, a totally different spin. So we've gone from like theoretical to application, and now we're talking about building an actual UI slash software service that can help people identify this after the fact but you know again creating that database for in potential situations to be used later on to help diagnose problems if it's been seen before um and the the funny part was is a a lot of these people that were speaking today were specifically engineers related and had studied resilience engineering in graduate school or in phd programs but really what this kind of came down to to me was basically taking critical incident technique which is basically an ad hoc uh, review of what happened during an accident in a very methodical way and they put it into a like a user interface that could be used by a lot of different people 
across so many different domains. Uh, so that kind of helped me understand a little bit why where they were coming from, from like on a resilience assessment. So it's more of understanding the underlying problems that led to the specific event and proposals for how you could change the, either the process or specific designs, depending on what event this was related to. Well, so that was kind of the majority of his talk. And it sounds like that would be a really challenging thing to design a, a system for so many different disparate types of users right um and and how do you tie that back into resilience like it, it it's really fascinating to me um especially as someone who's not involved in the healthcare domain at all and uh it, it really kind of makes me glad that we're covering this um healthcare human factors conference because uh it, it's it's bringing up all these issues that i didn't even know was a thing um it's amazing how like small, I guess your bubble can be until you actually go out of your comfort zone and realize that, you know, human factors is being utilized in a variety of different fields. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's something, man. Like this is, this is amazing. I thank you so much for taking all these notes too, because I'm, I'm pouring through these as you're going over them. And I'm, I apologize. I'm only half listening and reading (laughs) your notes at the same time, but, um, yeah. So, so it's all exciting stuff. Yeah, so I'm going to pop down to the third panel, if that's cool with you, Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Third panel. This Is the, is this the last one okay, that you attended so, for the day? Uh, yeah, this is the last one I've attended today. I've got more stuff I'm going to after this, but I'll end up talking about that with you and most likely at least tomorrow. So we'll have okay. a special guest on, I think. Yeah, special guest, at least. Um, She's been on the show before, so. Most definitely, yeah. <laughs> All right, so this, this last panel, okay, it's, it's pretty obvious that it brought me in just because of the name, um, but it's optimizing team performance and resource level in diverse healthcare contexts from surgery in Rwanda to medical event management in deep space. Whoa. So the, the deep space part was very interesting to me, but also the idea that this was like, it was going to give me information about what goes on in Rwanda what happens in the U S and then what happens when you take all of these kind of learnings into space. Um, so again, the style of this talk was much more like rapid fire, 10 minutes of, uh, four presenters getting up, um, talking about mainly focusing on non-technical skills. And I'll break that down a little bit as I go along, but focusing on non-technical skills of physicians in these different contexts. So in Rwanda, in the U S and UK, and then in deep space uh and then at the very end it was a lot of just the panel actually kind of going talking amongst themselves and arguing a little bit back and forth about um what they thought of specific specific researches or or research or tools that had come out of these kind of studies so let's uh, I'll, i'll keep it kind of moving here uh the first first study was really just a basic medical simulation um and it was using taking a tool that had been used in the UK very successfully to diagnose how well physicians were um, exhibiting non-technical skills with patients and nurses and anybody else they had to interact with in a patient's room under the intense stress of managing multiple patients at once, from everything from somebody something with a simple asthma case to full cardiac arrest all in one kind of small simulation. Um, and really, what this was, what they did, they had um, they had basic specific situations where they would run, you know, a a little simulate a little sim where they would have a doctor and a few nurses and then a few people acting as confederates, uh, as well as some, some dummy dolls that they would use for more intense like cardiac events and things like that. Um, but they would have they would have the doctors go through this very intensive like it, it, it has I, I'm imagining it's probably a little less stressful because they know that it's a simulation, but it has to be a norm pretty much as close as you can get to a normal intense day of working in the emergency emergency department of a hospital. Um, but really what they were have really what they did was this, they took these recordings and they had other senior physicians rate how the physician was doing in terms of communication, things like communication, being able to multitask in a hospital setting, um, how they dealt with, um, dealt with kind of mishaps from the nurses that were built into the simulation. Uh, but what they really found was that the UK tool was super useful because that, that was mainly the, the real focus of this study was what, 
or is the research we're seeing in the UK applicable here to the US because we have different standards of patient care and processes and hospital regulations than the UK does? What can we do to bring it in and kind of manipulate it and make it to, make it so it's useful in the US for doctors? Um, so the main thing was is that a lot of a lot of doctors, even though there's there's an intense debate of, through psycho or around psychology about whether multitasking is possible or not. The biggest aspect they found in the U.S. was they needed to have some measure or some ability for physicians to rate how residents were doing with regard to multitasking. Um, and I wish I had access to some of these simulation videos because I, I really have no concept of what it's like to be a resident or a, a senior physician. But what they were having these people go through of having separate nurses coming, bursting into um, rooms where patients were being interacted with by the doctor and then also nurses coming in and like needing your attention in a whole bunch of different places, getting phone calls for attentions on another floor. Like it was, it was very intensive and mentally taxing. It had to be. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's one thing I was going to ask about is, is did they show any videos? And you kind of answered that question for me, but I mean, it sounds like they didn't even describe sort of the, the, the scenario itself. Like, I, I mean, you, they said, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different patients to care for and, and sort of these different tasks going on, but they didn't describe what sort of that entailed, right? I mean, I'm assuming they're on the hospital floor and they're um, moving from room to room with, with uh, different responsibilities. And But I'd be curious, I'd be curious to see sort of what the actual scenario was and what it included. Yeah, and I think it was broken down into... Um, probably two segments right like uh, or at least this is what we what we were able to see is it was some kind of like relatively and this is relative for for other people but it's like a relatively simple thing to deal with um such as like dealing with somebody with asthma that needs needs an inhaler something simple that they knew how to take care of quite easily um and then something very intensive so having somebody that's experiencing some kind of cardiac arrest um and then in each one of those situations, things would go wrong. And so you would have to watch the resident deal with ha with either like misdiagnosis or something going wrong in the other room. Um, but the real focus here was trying to trying to understand, like, does do the same kind of needs for communication and multitasking or in the, in the U S case, multitasking transfer over. And is this, is this tool that was developed in the UK reliable for use with, you know, senior physicians rating residents to hopefully get them to improve over time and get better. Uh, so that was, that was really all that study was focused on, but really the key takeaway here is the non-technical skills were important as much as your technical skills were. So being able to, keeping calm under pressure and being able to communicate very succinctly and in a way that made sense to each person you had to interact with, um, as well as being able to multitask or ha or be able to hold in, in your cognitive load where you were in the process of doing each thing was really, really important. Um, but what the next speaker actually took this a little bit further, and I think this was kind of a, a – a great step forward of taking some of these non-technical skills and then really trying to build a, again, more AI or TV, TVD AI and ML product later in the future, where they took this kind of these scenarios that were developed for this, for that first study, looking at this tool. And they basically took, took real world examples of this. So let's say like a cardiac arrest event and what's going on in the OR and they broke that down using typical human factors methods. So they broke it down using a hierarchical task analysis. So trying to just lay out what are the what are the sequence of goals and tasks that have to be done during a cardiac event for a surgeon, for a nurse, for an anesthesiologist, everybody in the OR. Um, and then right. again, abstracting it one more time into a cognitive task analysis. So now we're looking more at what's going on in, from a mental workload perspective. Um, what are the what are the steps that have to be taken? That kind of stuff. So get taking it from task to now mental workload, and then this is where I got really really excited because we've talked a lot about over at least at least over the past year about the impact of devices that are measuring your heart rate at all times and how they can help help predict over time 
when averse events are going to happen. Well, they did a similar thing in a lot of the in this kind of study in which they now hooked up nurses and physicians and anybody in the OR with uh, I think it was I think it was just sensors. It wasn't like a Fitbit or anything, but it was sensors to record behavioral data, mainly focusing on heart rate variability. So they've now they've taken this hierarchical task analysis combined it with the cognitive task analysis and what they ultimately did is they mapped the behavioral measures throughout each one of those steps into a visualization so now that doctors can take a look at it in a dashboard format so now they've taken all this data that they've combined from where's the most stressful points in the or for a in this case a novice versus a senior position well what can we do to improve our like training paradigms based off of that can we get these is there any way or anything that we can implement that's going to make um kind of our resident physicians a little more proficient in the in the short term to match what's going on in terms of uh our senior physicians yeah that's so all these things kind of remind me that you know no matter where you are, you can use the same kind of techniques just applied to your specific domain. And it's really cool to see not only using established uh, sort of methods, but also combining those methods to create something new that is unique to your problem space. Like that, it's, it's pretty cool to see uh, sort of these emergent uh, analyses, I guess, if you will, um, you know, between the cognitive and hierarchical, like it's pretty cool. Yeah, and then to combine it with, you know, behavioral data that's going on. Yeah, you're getting from heart rate variability. And cre- and now you're going to go one more step and create some sort of very, very rudimentary, but useful dashboard for for people to be able to understand, like over time in the OR, where are the pain points in terms of physical data? Um, and right. What, and maybe what interventions can we put in and watch over time that may be able to improve it? So it was just a that particular study was a great uh, bring, bringing it together for all the human factors methods out there that are constantly used in different domains, but really applying it for this kind of context. Now, Blake, I, I have to know, you mentioned Rwanda, you mentioned space. We've got the in-between. Now I want you to go to the extremes. Yes. Okay. So th- this, this is absolutely mind blowing and I don't, I don't even know where to start with it. I'll just jump into it. So let's start with Rwandan uh, surgical, surgical teams. So a lot of what I've talked about is places of high resource. So we have in the, in the United States and in places in Europe and such like that, we have access to a lot of tools, a lot of resources, a lot of people, staff, um, nurses, people that have been educated in the same way that understand modern practices. Now, in Rwanda, there is a great medical field there. There is a fantastic, you know, set of doctors and nurses that work there. But there are they have what that what was what kept being referred to is variable resources. So it would often depend on depending on where you were in what hospital, um, what skills you were going to get, what skills certain techs had, what skills certain surgeons had. Um, also, what kind of communication methods were available. There were. In this, it was interesting to watch because part of what, what was going on here is companies were developing tools to help and show videos to new Rwandan kind of residents how to, how to interact in the OR for their specific context. And what actually happens in Rwanda is you'll have people that speak so many different languages in the same room that don't understand each other. So we've got people that are speaking French, people that are speaking the native Rwandan language, and then we've also got people just speaking English. And there's, there has to be interpreters of all kinds in the OR at all times uh, because there is not necessarily one unified language in that room. So that, that's an entirely different uh, problem set to have to think about or have to develop training curriculum curriculums around um, in and of itself. So it, it was an, an interesting talk to really think about, okay, not only are we having to think think about how to design for the technology they're using for the, the complexity of what's going on in the OR, but now we've got to also think about the diverse needs of each physician inside the OR. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's wow. That's something that I didn't think about was the communication between them, right? I mean, that's just something that we take for granted. And a lot of these, um, I guess, not variable resource. And should we change our tagline to variable resource? I, I don't know. But like, I, to me, these are just things that we take for granted here. And, and the fact that, you know, the, they can't even communicate using the same same language sometimes in in the same uh, operating room. That is just crazy to me. Well, yeah, and so let's now let's tra- transition to a low resource environment. So now this is this is in space. Well, so hang on before you from be, before you get into space. I I want to preface the space with we actually talked a lot about. Um, NASA on one of our first uh, live from HFES shows, and uh, I I remember a little bit of of what it takes to uh, for for healthcare in space. I mean, I the gist of what I got was that they are all trained a little bit, and there's one person that knows a little bit more, and then there's like really no solution if something really bad goes goes down. But I'm curious to see what this panel was all about. <laughs> Yeah, so this this part of the talk was it was it was it was interesting, but at the same time, I was a little bit confused about some of the methodology, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I, I wasn't actually aware of this. But in the next like ten years, NASA's planning a lot of missions to Mars and other close to Earth asteroids, and I I just kind of kind of was not aware of that. But that's that's Man. coming, and so research is being done now into like how they're going to prepare a medical bay for these kind of deep space trips as they were calling it. So the, these are manned trips. Yeah. These are fully manned trips to Mars and like close earth asteroids that are coming. Like I think, I think the earliest one is in 2030. Wow. That's, that's, yeah, that's coming right up here. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's scary to think about, but the, so the big question is, is that how do you care for astronauts on, on the space station? Um, and you know, typically when I when I heard that, I was like, "Well, we've done missions before to different planets. Like, what what's really different here?" And they brought up, or Jamie Robertson brought up a lot of really great issues that I had no idea were problems. Uh, with the biggest one being, of course, that that when we're talking deep space, so beyond beyond kind of the moon and towards asteroids and towards Mars there is no longer the option for a quick return if a serious medical event occurs you can't just you know change the course in an easy way that's going to slingshot you back in a you know relatively shorter time frame than it would have been i mean these are long missions that are 3 to 4 years long like minimum i think is what they were saying and so that's a giant issue also it, and I, could, I really could not fathom that this was the case, but there's a lot of great tech that goes into a space space station, right? But at the same time, right now, before these missions, the people that are actually running these simulations don't know what that technology looks like, what the space station's going to look like, what's going to be in it, how things are being laid out. None of that stuff is available at this moment because they're having to build that and engineer that kind of stuff for mars trips specifically for whatever asteroids they're going to try and visit so that even brings a larger problem into the space is that they can't really make too many assumptions because the the (laughs) the space station just does not exist at the moment that's crazy that they have to talk about getting to the left right i mean this is as as about as far left as you can get on something and uh who knows if it's still going to be enough obviously it's important that they're thinking about this stuff but um that's a really unique uh challenge how do you design for something that you don't know any of the parameters of and i mean yeah a lot of the a lot of human factors practitioners deal with this you just have to kind of make assumptions and uh hope those assumptions are followed through and uh exactly yeah well what, okay here's kind of what they have done so far right is they've so they they like you said there's going to be a majority of just one physician but all team members will be trained to some amount on how to handle a medical event and how to aid the sole physician and that's part of the research they're doing now is trying to determine what that is what does that look like what are possible medical or what's i guess the worst possible medical events that can happen and how much training should the normal person have so that's another thing they're trying to really bake in here is trying to figure out what what level of knowledge to give people right Um, and so 
that's also building crew composition. I mean, is it enough to only have one position? They're they're totally not sure at this point and time, right? Um, but what they did do is they developed a based off of what they can get from engineering teams that are trying to build the space stations now and how much space there will be dedicated approximately to a medical bay they have built kind of prototype simulation rooms based on past space stations what has worked what hasn't interacting with engineering teams to kind of build as much as they can um and it really comes down to like a, a simple medical bay with um the ability to interact with mission control so that would be people on the terrestrial or the ground here here on earth uh, along with systems to interact with anybody else throughout the space station they may need help from um, and so all of their simulations were basically run with one one important parameter that I didn't really understand why they didn't change. And that's the, the and I, I, maybe it's because I did research in this in UAS, um, but the latency between how much time it's going to take to sell oh, yeah. to home, to home, to, to earth, and then get a reply back. I'm sorry, right. That that actually wasn't taken into account. And that'll be in later studies. Uh, but again, it was really Go ahead, Nick. Sorry. Oh yeah, oh, I was just gonna say, uh, adding on to that, it's the, there's already a, an existing body of research with latency in like robotic surgery, right? So if you have telepresence robots that are conducting surgery and 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 surgeons that are on the other side of that, um, they there's lag in in these things and when when you take that to the extreme when when you have uh these low resource contests like contexts like space and somebody way out in space and it takes like uh, you know a full 16 minutes for something to come and go back uh yeah I, there's definitely challenges with that and i'm i'm so i want to i want to see that follow-up study because uh that that's really interesting to me uh, on to like how are they going to tackle that <laughs> Yeah, and ultimately, Nick, I mean, that's that was, in my head, probably the biggest player or the biggest thing that they should be considering because if they're relying on, like, mission control for so much in these simulations now, I mean, that's drastically going to change uh, as latency is introduced. Because I saw that even in doing simulations for UAS studies where, you know, we introduced a, a delay for interacting or for... Yeah, for ATCs giving commands to a UAS system, and there was a lot of frustration in that shorter delay, which was around three seconds. And now right. we're talking as much as who knows how many minutes. Well, um, so I yeah, mean, it's a very interesting set of problems. I'm curious to get your take on this, Blake. I, th I think there's, um, or at least you know, from what I've read, there's a lot of talk about robotics being the future of healthcare in terms of surgery. And I'm wondering if, you know, we can sort of integrate some sort of artificial intelligence, machine learning aspects into robotic surgery. So that way, you know, there, there doesn't have to be that latency um, when there are people in space, you can just have a robot take care of it, unless it's something that's highly specialized or something that, um, that the robot doesn't have access to, you know, I, I think it's a lot easier to send, um, a set of instructions to a robot. Uh, ho hopefully it would have some sort of onboard memory for um, some of the more well-known procedures, but then maybe a doctor back home could be uh, potentially, you know, ha have the data sent to them and then set a, send a set of instructions for the robot to perform with no operator input. That, that to me seems like the best case scenario if something were to go wrong on one of these uh, deep space missions. Yeah, in reality, I mean, I think that should be the ultimate answer. Um, and again, I'm not in the healthcare field, but if, if we really think about it, I mean, what are the odds of, let's say, uh, I don't know, a five to ten to ten man manned mission to Mars, and you have one dedicated physician or maybe two? How likely? What's the likelihood or risk that one of them? becomes ill or this event happens to them and how are they going to be able to relay the information they need to if it's if it's serious enough that they can't um, so in that case something something in the line of robotics being able to help and take care of some of this some of these problems makes sense but i think the the real problem is and maybe maybe you have a better opinion on this but i think the real problem is robotics and ai are just not quite there yet in terms of human no precision. yeah <laughs> But well, Blake, we're talking about what twenty thirty, I think, is when you said is when these missions are going to start, right? So we still yeah. have years to perfect this. So, so if we design knowing or 
under the assumption that these these technologies will be more developed, will, that will be more mature by the time we choose to do this. Um, that I think is also a, a good way to go too. I mean, obviously we can't count on it, but uh, if we if we set a goal and and try to meet that, then maybe these technologies will will take off in ways that we didn't expect. It, it's always possible for sure, and having this like ten year line gap. I mean, I, a lot of a lot of things that I've seen recently about AI or ML is just this the sky is falling view and I feel like this kind of context is really where it could provide so much value and life-saving value in this case um absolutely it's, it's, it's worth a shot right I agree I mean I know this is hard sci-fi but have you seen uh I think it was passengers that did this maybe it wasn't passengers I don't know but but basically I, I think it was passengers anyway they go into this like this pod and if they have something wrong with them the, the computer scans them and then the the robot will actually take care of everything and uh that to me was always really appealing because you know robots do everything 100 percent of the time 100 percent correct 100 percent of the time so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's kind of the dream right and i think that makes the most sense uh in the long haul <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, do you have any other closing thoughts or should we get out of here and and, uh, let you go do some networking tonight? Oh, I think this is about all I got, guys. All right. Well, that's it for today, everyone. What did you guys think? Did you guys see something interesting at the Healthcare Symposium today? Let us know. Uh, You can follow us all over social media. Head on over to our Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. We're at H Factors Podcast. Please, please, please join the discussion on our Slack. Link to that is in the show notes on our Twitter bio. You can find it pretty much anywhere we're found. Um, Please join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, you see something good over there, the healthcare symposium leave us a voicemail that's 901-646-1432 again that's 901-646-1hfc you can support us on our patreon at patreon.com slash human like i said we just make big changes to that so go check us out be sure to like subscribe review us on pretty much anywhere podcasts are found you know wherever you can get those for free and of course you can reach us at our home on the Com. Mr. Blake Arnstorff, thank you so much for being our field correspondent reporter. Uh, from the Healthcare Symposium, where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about deep space healthcare? Oh, God. If you guys want to talk about deep space healthcare, hit me up on Twitter at DumbFanduX. If you want to see a little bit more of what I've been doing while I'm here in the, 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 the Healthcare Symposium, check me out on Instagram at DumbFanduX as well. Excellent. And uh, I will be sure to follow along with those. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast Healthcare Symposium bonus episodes. Until next time, it depends. Yeah. How about that for laugh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>